So a bit of background on Jeff. Went to the University of Michigan, played football there, three-year starter, was signed by the Seattle Seahawks, and agreed to play if they would let him go get his MBA at Michigan at the same time, because that's what was important to Jeff, because this is, besides being an amazing athlete, he's an amazing business person, and he'll tell you all about it. We just gave a book to everybody, The Art of Branding Yourself. That's Jeff's book, and I highly encourage you to read it, because there are so many great life lessons in there. Jeff has a lot of great lessons for you. He's a phenomenal speaker. He's a phenomenal person. He's my dear friend who goes out of his way to help me despite a lot of bumps in the road. And I just thank you. And I'm so glad you're here. And I'm going to let you take over. How you doing? Hey, it's good to be back here at Grady. You know, I was here last year. And uh, I noticed, I know a couple of the young people have already come by to see me that know I'm in town. Uh, yeah, it's been a heck of a day. And uh, no, the plane wasn't delayed, I missed my flight. Okay, so there's, a, there's three things I'm gonna address today, and but I wanna do a little different than last year. I wanna go, Liz, gather my time. I wanna make sure I give you time to ask me questions and address the thing. Last year, when I get rolling, I can talk. And when I get rolling, I will talk to you and hit you right between the eyes. When I speak to you, I know you've got a lot of different people coming in, and uh, I appreciate this class and appreciate what Liz and your teacher is doing here. And I know you got a speaker every other week or every week, and most of them are talking about their careers and helping you look at things and aspirations that you want to do. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but my approach is I'm going to talk about you. I'm gonna talk about you, I'm gonna get in your head, and I'm gonna talk about you, and I'm gonna wake you up a little bit, okay? Cause I got kids too. And I'm gonna talk to you about three things today. One's responsibility. Two is making good choices. And three is building your brand. And that's what my book is about, your brand. My second book will be released in September. Uh, and that one we're working on a movie deal with Paramount to make a movie out of the book about me and my family and my brothers. Well, they said they asked me that last year. We got a couple young ladies from last year's class that asked me that. We'll deal with that later. Okay, but, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, talk about responsibility. Yeah, I can come in here right now. And uh, as Leah said, we've had our challenges in trying to get me here. I was supposed to be here in January and that didn't work out. I was supposed to be here last year. Well, the challenges were not fault. Yeah. Well, it doesn't, matter about, it doesn't matter about whose fault. With responsibility comes accountability, okay? And so, you know, let me just start with my day and I will own up to my responsibility of the fact that, yeah, the lines were long at 5.40 this morning, me trying to get to the airport, okay? That's an excuse. So I should've got there earlier for a 6.50 flight that left at 6.40, okay? So the airport, the plane left early. Okay, still my fault, I should have been there early. Okay, so it doesn't matter. So I sit in the airport three hours, then gotta go to Charlotte to get to Atlanta, land here at one o'clock to get here to see you guys. And then leave here and drive to Birmingham to speak tonight to 2,000 people. And then speak tomorrow in Mobile, Alabama, tomorrow afternoon to a conference. And then fly back home to Columbus, Ohio, okay? But Grady is my priority. And Liz will tell you, there was another company that wanted me to speak at 3 o'clock today. Wanted me to speak to his employees today at 3 o'clock. I told him, no, not Liz. I said, this group right here, these young people are more important for me to speak to. I won't be done at 3 o'clock. I can't finish with my young people at 3 o'clock and then run across town to talk to your employees because my young people are priorities. Okay? I care about you more than I do some company that has employees and want me to talk to them too, because you're our future. And I, say, and I say that a couple things, and I say that a couple things, and then I'll really get in and we start talking. See, because I've been where you are, okay? And one thing about me is this, I haven't forgot where I've come from, okay? I've done a lot, I've had a lot of success, I've won a lot of awards, 
I've been very successful in the best companies in the world, as well as now my own businesses, my own speaking, national speaking circuit, wrote the books and everything else. See, I could be bougie, okay? But I don't know how to spell the word. Don't care how to spell the word. Because what's important to me is making sure that folks like yourself, folks like my three, they're not little anymore. Matter of fact, all of them are older than everybody in this room probably now. I'll talk about them in a minute. Understand that who I am and who you are is our future. You are somebody. You can be anything you want to be if you believe that. Okay, there are a lot of distractions and a lot of opportunities for us as young people. And I'm not young anymore. I'm an old man, as my son tells me. I'm 50 years old. Yeah, I know I don't look it. Thank you. <laughs> my body feels it because of the pain I've been through in sports and everything else. But I train every day. I work out for two hours every day to take care of this right here. Appreciate that. You know, but, you know so, so, I, so I talk about that because as we as young people strive to achieve the things that you expect and you want to achieve out of life and deal with the naysayers, many of you in this room have been told that you won't be about nothing, that you can't go to the schools you want to go to. You can't get in Stanford. You can't get in Spelman. You can't get in Howard. You can't get in Florida a and You can't get in Emory. You can't get in Georgia Tech. You can't get in the University of Michigan, which is our alma mater. But I'm telling you, and I'm proud of this, and Liz don't know this yet, this weekend, my baby girl, who just turned 18, just accepted she'll be going to University of Michigan next fall. Straight A student, straight A student, my son plays football on football scholarship at University of Toledo. My oldest daughter, who was a doctor here in Atlanta, just 28, just turned 28, is now a doctor in Birmingham. She had her own practice here in Atlanta, went to Spelman, went to Emory, and then did her, her medical work at John Hopkins, three of the best schools in the country. Okay? A little black girl. Okay? And see, so I tell, my, I tell my kids all the time, don't ever let anybody tell you what you can't do. Always encourage. And so my point is this. We as young people have odds. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what nationality you are. We're all put in a bubble. And we're put in that bubble to say what you can't do. You control what you can't do. Now, but that doesn't mean your pants down here, young fellas, trying to be cool, you know, and, 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 you know, I don't care how many athletes got earrings in their ear, that's for girls. Any kind of earring. Okay, earrings are made for women to put in their ears. And see, my point is, stop being cool and let's get focused. Let's get focused on what you want to do. So I start with that by saying this. Who are you? Who are you? Before you can do anything or be anybody, you have to understand who you are. And every one of you in this room are different. Every one of you are different. In the first chapter of that book, my first question is, who are you? Do you know who you are? Because until you understand who you are and what you're about, you can never figure out where you're going. Because you all have different strengths, you all have different forms and focus areas that make you who you are. But when you define who you are, then you can start building where you're going. Some of you, if I ask most of you, who are you? What would you say? Okay, good. I like that. Who are you? 
Speak up, I can't hear you. Okay, who are you? Okay, who are you? Okay, who are you? Yeah. Okay, okay. Most of the time, when you ask someone who are they, or most people stop you in society, they want to know who you are, what do you do, and what kind of car you drive. Am I right or wrong? Okay, we as young people get hung up on, man, that's dope, man, he's driving a Bentley. Or he's driving a Benz. Or he's driving a Lexus. And we determine success based on material things. Exactly right. That's right. A car. Oh, they live out, they live up in Sugarloaf or a country club of the South. Where there's money. Not that I live over here on MLK. Or not that I live over in what's south of the airport. Yeah. See, it's all, it's all, it's all, we, we are so screwed up in society because we're focused on, and we get, and we screw you young people up. Because everything is about dollars and cents and about trying to be status quo, rather than helping you all understand that you're successful regardless. I don't care if you're driving a Yugo. And y'all too young to know what a Yugo is. A Yugo used to be a little, like, like a smart car, a little smart car. That's so dangerous, you get on the road, you can't even move. See, our society is, 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 is built on material things. And I want you to understand is it's not about material. Material doesn't mean anything. That doesn't define your success. You define your success by understanding who you are and then figuring out what you want to be. And now's the time for you guys to start understanding and figuring out what you want to do with your life. Because if you don't understand, start understanding that today, and some of you sooner than today, it's gonna be a long journey. Cause brothers in here, let me tell you something. There are a whole lot of us locked up for dumb stuff. Sisters, there are a whole lot of y'all locked up for dumb stuff. It don't matter what it is. I ain't going there. But the bottom line is because we made bad decisions and bad choices. You control the decisions and choices you make. My point is this. Don't let others define who you are because you control that destiny. Your destiny is about you understanding who, where, and what you want to be. Now, a lot of them, I mean, last year, a lot of them, oh, I want to be an athlete, I'll be the next Michael Jordan. That's fine. I want to be the next this and that. That's fine. I want to be the next... Tyra Banks, that's fine. Dream, it's okay to dream. It's okay to dream. But with that dream, young people, there's work. There's work. Oprah didn't come the richest woman in America and the world by not working. When you own your own television station and network, it took a lot of work. So don't think that that stuff comes easy. You have dreams, dream, dream big. But understand, with responsibility comes accountability. With accountability comes responsibility. And it's all about work ethic. It's about doing things you don't want to do. I'm sure there's times you get up in the morning and you just don't feel like doing that. Because you're tired. But you got to push forward. You got to make yourself do it. There's days, there are a lot of times, I do things I don't want to do, but I do it because I have to do it, because I'm responsible. Others are depending on you. You have brothers and sisters, baby. You have nephews. You have cousins. There are people every day just watching you and what you're doing. There's peers of yours that you run with, girlfriends, male friends, acquaintances that watch what you do. 
And you never know what you do, what influence that has on somebody else. Because somebody in here, and hopefully more than one of you in here, will be very successful. Sit in this room right now. We'll be, whatever you're doing, we'll be very successful. And I ain't talking about money. I'm talking about whether you're a judge, were you the best sanitation worker in the city of Atlanta? It don't matter. What matters is that you're doing the absolute best that you can do. You're proud of what you're doing. You're happy about what you're doing. And you're the best at it. So whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, or whether you're sweeping the streets downtown, if you're doing the best you can do and you're happy and excited about that, no one can pass judgment on you but you. Whether you're doing nails, whether you're doing hair, whether you're a barber. It's not defined based on dollars and cents, folks. It's based on what your dream is and what you want to do and how you build that. Ten years ago, Tyler Perry was homeless. Homeless. Tyler Perry with his silly self, was living under a bridge in New Orleans. Yeah, the Tyler Perry with all the movies out now and the man made more money than he'd ever think about Joe spending. Lived under a bridge in New Orleans 10 years ago. 10 years ago. He couldn't get nobody to even look at the scribble he was writing under a bridge at night. Cold. Nobody. All they saw was the exterior. A smelly old dirty guy pushing a cart with all his worldly possessions in New Orleans. Tyler Perry. My dear. Okay? Look what my is doing today. My dear can buy New Orleans. He had a dream. He had a desire. He was focused and didn't quit. You'll have 10 doors closed in your face before one opens. But you can't quit. There are many a day people will say no. They will say no. They will say no. But all you need is the one, yes. But if you quit the first no or the hundredth no, that 101st may be your ticket. It's about staying with it, staying focused with it, and following your aspirations and dreams. But before you do all that, you got to make good decisions. And good decisions are not being a knucklehead. Young ladies or young men. Being a knucklehead. Young ladies, you can wait till you're done fulfilling some of your dreams. And don't let these little boys press you, push up on you. <laughs> don't let them push up on you. Because you control your body. Okay? Not some little boys' desires and wants that want to kill your dream because you want to have a baby and he ain't going to be there to take care of that baby. And you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or a police officer or a police woman, whatever. Don't allow others to define who you are. You define yourself. And you got to start now. Don't wait till you're 19 and 20 to try figuring out what I want to do with my life. Okay, you got to start doing it now. Because if you don't do it now, you'll never do it. And you'll be on the cover of Busted with that mug shot saying, why didn't I listen the four years I was in high school? I was a knucklehead. I thought I was cool. You know, I wanted to smoke weed. I wanted to shoot dice. I, that's, that's, I ain't heard that one in a long time. They still shooting crap. 
up in the corner. And I know some areas in land they do it too. You know? You know, mess with that crack pipe was better than, than studying. I wanted to be the prat I wanted to be Arne SJ or Bruce Poos and be in school and be the comedian and not learn anything. Or Kevin Hart, who was real funny. They say, I, I may be old, but I know what's going on. I saw Kevin Hart last week. You talking about funny? That boy funny. But nobody funny than Arne SJ. I'm telling you, from Atlanta. I saw Arnest Joe's first show when he started in October of 1990. His first show. Most of y'all probably weren't even born yet. Arnest J is the baddest comedian out there, I'm telling you. Bernie Mac and all them guys ain't got nothing on Arnest. Arnest J is funny. You know what Arnest J is? You need to watch, you need to watch Comedy Central. Bill Crawford funny too, he's a big fat guy. Yeah. We remember what Crawford always talking about eating chicken. Yeah, yeah. But my point is this. Them guys define themselves. Here, here was a bunch of young men and some more and the rest of them, you know, with her bad mouth. However, they're funny. And they're folks that would not let anybody define who they are. They define themselves. So again, it don't matter what profession or what you do, it's about do you know who you are? And you got to know who you are in order to get to where you want to be. You know, someone asked me after I wrote this book, they said, so who are you? I'm a father of three. I'm an African-American. I'm a no-nonsense person. I'm spoiled. I'm shy. Now, when I say that one, 99% of people know me, tell me, there's no way in the world you're shy. Hey, let me tell you something. 20 years ago, there's no way in the world I would've gotten in front of you and spoke. Scared to death. 20 years ago, there's no way in the world I'm getting in front of nobody and talking. Nobody. Because that wasn't my thing. I wasn't comfortable. And I like to talk but not in front of people. But one of my aspirations was, I'm going to write a book. Two, I'm going on the national speaking circuit and tour. And if you get me going, I can be real funny. I'll have you laughing. The day's not the time for that, but I will have you laughing. Because I love cutting up. But I had to define who I was in all of that. But it all took building a plan and being focused and preparing where I wanted to go with my life. You know, I met Liz 13, 15 years ago here in Atlanta. I've lived in Atlanta twice. And I met Liz. I'm not going to tell you who she was working for at the time. Young fellas, I hope you got something in your wallet. Because Liz, that's the company Liz used to work for. The little things you carry in your wallet to protect babies. I ain't saying no more. That was the company Liz worked for. She was one of the executives there. Condom, fella. <laughs> and so, and like, as, as Liz told you, we went to college together. And lived in the same dorm, and I never knew Liz. I met Liz 15, 20 years after, well, not 20, but 15 years after we graduated. The same time, same year, lived in the same dorm. I never knew her. I told them while you're out, my daughter announced last weekend she's going to Michigan next year. My baby girl. So my, my point is this, and this is a part I'm going to deal with too. That's what I was talking about before. You never know who in the room is going to be successful. Because, see, we didn't know each other. But I'll tell you one thing, Liz don't have to ask me twice to come and help her with her dream and her vision to work and help with you young people. You can ask me twice. Because I'll, I'll be here. I don't care when it is, I'll find a way to get here. I'll change my schedule. I'll reroute myself. But to help her dream to helping you and you don't have to pay me a dime. 
I speak, travel all the country and speak probably four or five times a month. Four or five times a month. At a fee of five, five, five to $10,000 per speech. Per speech. But what I'm doing here is because of Liz's vision, Liz's dream, and my love for young people. And it ain't costing her a dime. And I will never take a dime to be part of a few words to help you folks understand that it's about you. And it's about you preparing yourself. Now, because that's important, I know some of you know everything. I know there's, there's, there's at least one of y'all in this room that think you know everything. There's one of you in here that's giving your parents holy hell because you know everything. That gives your, your teachers holy heck because you know everything. You want to do things your way because you know everything. We don't know anything. We haven't experienced anything in our lives and they're taking their time, whether it's Grady or other schools here, to help you grow and be successful. But you know it all. You know it all. Your parents trying to help you. Whether it's your mom, whether you're from a single family, it don't matter. Busting their butt trying to help you, but you know it all. My kids are the same way, hard heads. Until I jacked my son up one day and say, here's the phone, call the police. They'll be here, and I'll be here when they get here. But as long as you live in my house, it's going to be my way. And if you don't like it, pack your shit and get out. OK? Because, see, the point is this. As long as I'm paying bills in that house, I control that house. When you think you know more than me and want to do things the way you want to do it, it's time to get to stepping, okay? And I don't care where you go, and I don't care about what daddy did this, daddy did that, okay? When you're grown, you make your decisions as a grown person. As long as I'm the daddy, and will always be the daddy, and I don't care if you're 40 or 50 years old, I will still be the daddy, and you in my house, you operate under my rules, okay? And that goes for you the same way in your classroom. Do you know the effort that it takes for your teachers to prepare, to educate you young people, to help you go out in society to be successful? And some of you don't take advantage of that opportunity? You don't take advantage of it. Folks, take advantage of every opportunity you have. Because I'm going to go back to that success piece. Somebody in here is going to be very successful. Okay? If somebody's sitting beside you right now that you may not like or you may not know, may be that one that's successful and you never know it. See, I used to be a practical joker. I'm going to tie this around. When I was in junior high school, I was a clown. I loved to play games until somebody got my attention one day. I loved to play games. And what I missed was this. That there was people along my life that I didn't take advantage of that are very successful today. And I call that the invisible chair. You're reading in the book, the invisible chair. Because there's people sitting beside you on airplanes, on trains, on buses, in your classroom that you don't even know. And you don't even, because you're too tired, you're too cool, you don't have aspirations to know. I was on a flight probably 10, 12 years ago now, one night on a red eye, come back from San Francisco. And I, I fly around the world. I'm all over the world. Asia, Shanghai, everywhere. Thailand, Brazil, Mexico, you name it, I've been there. And I was on this flight this night, and I was tired. I mean, I, I had been working, I was tired. And this lady sitting beside me wanted to talk. She wanted to talk. And I said, I'll tell you who it is in a minute, because you all know who it is. I said, listen, baby, I'm tired. Sit over there and be quiet. I'm going to sleep. And she kept on talking.
she said, no, you stay, I'm, she said, I don't like flying. You stay up and talk to me all night. We ain't sitting in first class. And I said, would you go to sleep? And she just roughed them out with her long dreads. And I said, Whoopi, would your butt go to sleep? She said, no, you gonna talk to me. So we talked the whole plane ride from San Francisco to New York. Five and a half hours. Red eye, now one, two o'clock in the morning. And she talked the whole, she talked all night long. But you know, what I learned from that, and I talk about it in the book, is you never know what influence or impact or who you're gonna run into. Now, that happened to be Whoopi and I who she was, but a hundred other times, I'm sitting beside a CEO of a company, uh, a homeless person, uh, someone that don't have nothing or we, it appears you don't have nothing. Because I'll tell you, most of the time when I travel, I got my ball cap on, I got my shades on, I got my hat cocked to the side, and I got a sweatsuit on. Okay? And I don't care what nobody thinks. Because I'm being me, I'm being comfortable. Okay, and people, I've had people tell me, well, you ain't got nothing. Who are you? Who do you think you are? You know, you just a little, a little uh, I've been called a jitterbug, a thud, because I got my shades on and my hat cocked to the side. And I just laugh. And I told this one guy one day, I said, you know something? I got more money, I can buy you and your family. You know, and see, see, my point is this. Don't, don't judge people by their exterior. Don't prejudge people. Don't prejudge people. Because you never know when you need that person. I tell another story in the book about an elderly white gentleman back in, here in Atlanta, 1985. I was coming back from Oxford, Mississippi. And y'all too young to know about a lot was going on back in the South before y'all was born. Okay? And so Oxford, Mississippi was one of the most, most racist parts of the country in America. And I was on an airplane with a gentleman coming back from Oxford to Atlanta, and he leaned over to me and said, hey, boy. Now, I was a lot younger then and had a lot more craziness in me. I done calmed down a lot in 25 years. And, and, and the, point, the point is this. He kept talking, so my, boy, my boss was an a, a older white gentleman. He said, I think he's talking to you. Me and him had a good relationship. I said, no, he ain't talking to me, call me boy, he ain't. Long story short is this. Me and this guy got to talking. He gave me his card. He said, if I can never do anything for you, call me. This guy had never dealt with black folks. He was very rude, very disrespectful. Okay, but I used that as an advantage. What this gentleman said, this gentleman was about 70 years old then, had been raised in the Deep South, raised during slavery, and all he knew was slavery. So what I did was, I had a conference in Memphis, I invited him in a year later. Again, we're back to perception again. I had a perception of him, he had a perception of me. I invited him in. This guy looked like a bum. I formed an opinion of him as a young person. Once I get to know him, this guy's family was the founder of Mississippi, University of Mississippi. The founder, deep pockets, real deep pockets. His pockets so deep, he couldn't walk. Perception. Don't formulate opinions of people from the exterior. Me and this guy, before he died, became very good friends. Now, when he met me, he didn't like me because he said to me, I was raised not to like you people. Y'all had separate wa wa water fountains and everything else. What he learned in our interaction was this, that people are people. I don't care what color you are, what race you are, what nationality you are, we're all people. Okay, and the thing we taught him before he died was, and he said to me, he says, I didn't have to be this way for all these years. That's just the way I was taught. Now I understand that it's not about what I was taught. 
It's about engaging others and accepting people for who they are, regardless of color, race, anything else. And so my point, again, is stop forming opinions of people because of what you see from the outside. Because Tyler Perry would have never got that chance. Several others would have never got that chance. And you won't get that chance if you believe that way. Who are you? What do you stand for? And what are you about? Are you one that's willing to help others? Are you one that's going to go out of your way to help others? Or are you one that's all about you and you don't care about the success of others? Because one day, you will need others. It may not be next year, it may not be five years from now, maybe 20 years from now. You never know when that other is sitting right beside you right now. You never know when that other is someone you haven't met yet, but it was a missed opportunity because you didn't speak to them when you were on the train. You didn't get to know them. You didn't ask them for their card. What do you do? Can I talk to you sometime to understand more about your business? Don't be bashful. Ask. Because all they can say is no. And 100 no's, 101 could be that yes. That takes you over the top. Now Liz talked about a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about business and then I'll, I'll be quiet. I spent 25 years in the corporate world. I was the number three guy at Walmart. Walmart has 1.8 million employees. I was the third highest ranking in Walmart, making a whole lot of ching ching. Okay, ran all the Sam's Clubs worldwide. I was the top executive at Pepsi. I signed Michael Jackson to a $25 million commercial. Shaquille O'Neal to his first $25 million contract when he came in the league with Orlando Magic doing Aquafina water commercials. I signed Madonna. And work with the best of them. But they put their pants on just like I do. They just got more money. Okay? But it's not about money. But I've had fun in my career. I've had a lot of fun in my career. Okay? But if I keep that all built up and don't spread that love and aspiration to you folks, then I'm not doing my part. So what I do. Poor fellow, he tired. What I do is make sure that every ounce of my energy is about giving back. And so as I stayed in the corporate world, I decided, how, what can I do to help young people? So in 1997, I started a foundation. I paid for 47 kids to go to college in the last 13 years out of my pocket. Not nobody else's pocket, my pocket. Not my kids, everybody else's kids. You go to college. Because I was so tired of young people talking about, I can't afford to go to school. And a lot of it is you don't know where to go get the money. OK? So that's not an excuse. Don't use that excuse, I can't go to college, because they, there's plenty of money out there to continue to college. Plenty of money. You just got to know where to go get. So I started a foundation to help young people go to college. A lot of it came out of my pocket, but also came out of helping you understand where to get the money from so that you can be who you want to be and you can achieve those goals. A-OK. -okay. Athletes, Opportunities, and Kids. And my website is www.athletesopportunities.org. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you that stuff in a minute. You know, so, and now what I do is what I do now. I speak on a lot of different subjects, a lot of different topics. Groups from 8-year-old to 80-year-old. To corporate rooms, to Bill Gates. I work with Bill Gates three, three, at least three weeks a year. He's head of Microsoft. You know, Ken Chenault, head of American Express, a brother. Okay? Ursula Barnes, sister, head of Xerox. Okay? And I can keep going on and on and on. Barry Rand, Avis. And see, so people had dreams and had focus and had aspirations. Okay? My aspiration was. I did my 25 years in corporate. Now I'm doing my own thing. And I'm doing it because I can take the time to do the things like I'm doing here right now and not be bogged down by 
a corporate job. Now, I'll close with this. My very special friend who is writing the forward for my new book that will be released in about three months, who's from here in Atlanta. She has two beautiful boys, a uh, very special friend of mine, and uh, Judge Hatchet, Glenda Hatchet. That's my girl. Don't hate. That's my girl. And so when Glenda says, Jeff, I need you to do this for me, I remember when she was the, the, the juvenile judge there here at Fulton County, I used to go to the jail to go in there and talk to them knuckleheads. I, there's one little boy I'll never forget. He was, he was nine years old. He had stole 13 cars. He was nine years old and stole 13. He couldn't even, steal the, couldn't even steal the steering wheel. He kept stealing cars and crashing cars. He was a knucklehead. 13 cars when he was nine years old. He stole them and wrecked them because he couldn't see. And so I remember going in and talking to some of them young kids and then getting locked in there and clink, clink, clink. I said, no, I don't want to be here. That little young boy today didn't make the right choices. Because I, I follow him right now. And he locked up where he was for 13, 14 times when he was nine. And now he's 29. And he's doing exactly what I told him to happen to him if he didn't make the right decisions. He didn't listen. And he's locked up for first-degree murder, serving the rest of his life because he didn't make the right choices when he was young. If you hear nothing else today, folks, with accountability comes responsibility. Okay, you got to be responsible for you. Your parents can only do so much for you. I use the saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. Stop fighting and battling with those that's trying to help you. Stop fighting with those that's trying to, that's been there, may not have accomplished some of the things you want to accomplish, but understand the real world. Listen before you talk. Step back before you get that attitude or get that, as you girls say, get that little head rocking like my daughter does with her little big head stuff. Think you should know everything? Listen. Follow your dream. Follow your dream. Don't let those naysayers, I don't care who they are. Sometimes in life, folks, and I'm going to say this. Sometime in life, you got to cut off those that's closest to you. See, I made a decision a year ago that there are people in my life that no longer be part of my life. Family members. It has nothing to do with who I am or status. It's about I will not allow negativity in my life. If you're negative, you can't be part of my life. Because when you have negativity around you, you breed negativity and you become negative. So if you got negative people in your life, folks, you need to think about that. Now, I wish I would have known that years ago and got rid of some negativity in my life and I wouldn't have this white hair I got right now. I won't allow negativity. If you're negative and you want to sit back and do your thing and you have no aspirations, I ain't got time for you. Because, see, you control your destiny. Don't sit back and say, I couldn't do it because they wouldn't let me. That they won't let me, you control that. Any of you. I don't care if you're skateboarding. I was on, on the plane a couple weeks ago with that skateboard guy. Bad dude. That boy's bad. He's the one who does all this skating stuff and flips and, and crazy stuff. Wears his hat backwards all the time. But that boy, Sean, what's his name? Sean something, what's his name? You know, little boy skateboard? Huh? No, I'm I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just saying. Sean White. Bad dude. Bad dude. And see, and, and I talked to him, I said, you know, I said, why did you start doing this? He said, because the way the way that he would he said I had all kinds of negativity in his life. And he said his only outlet was to skateboard. So he started skateboarding. And he said he took his frustration out and all the negativity around him through skateboard. 
So he go out there, he said, early in the morning to late at night, all he did was skateboard. And his dream now is he went in, what, the Extreme Olympics, doing a lot of commercials, skateboarding doing something he wanted to do, and he pursued that dream. So like I said before, it ain't about the what. It's about what you want to accomplish, what you want to do, and whether or not you under, understand enough about yourself to get there. And you got to have a plan. You don't just do it. You got to have a plan. You always got to have a plan. Prepare yourself and have a plan. Have a plan. Sit down and think about what you want to do and challenge yourself. Make some goals now. Hide them. Come back five years later or look at them periodically and say, am I on track? Am I not on track? If you're off track, get back on track. That's how you challenge yourself. Plan now. Prepare yourself now. I'll open it up for questions. Liz? We ever told no? Have I ever told no? Have you ever been told no? I've been told no all my life. What kind of, what, what were some of the things or one of the things that you were told no about? The most important thing I was told no about, when I came out of, when I came out of high school, I was in honor society and everything else, and I was a three-sport All-American in, in, uh, in, in sports, football, basketball, and baseball. And my dad told me and several people in my neighborhood said, because I went to an all-black high school, that I would never be successful and I could never ever go to Michigan and be successful in Michigan. Because Michigan was the Harvard of the Midwest or the Stanford and there's no way in the world I'd ever make it in Michigan. And I fought hard my senior year to defy that and I went to Michigan. Because everybody, I went to Michigan versus USC and Alabama and a lot of the other big football programs because Michigan had the academic standards that I wasn't good enough or supposedly couldn't do. Because that's what everybody else said. So I went to Michigan, not only proved that I was a good athlete, but that I could excel academically. And I got my undergrad degree and my MBA from Michigan. But I wasn't smart enough. So while I was told no, I proved people wrong that I could be successful and do it if I wanted to do it. And I did it. How do you think you learned that? Where did you learn, don't just accept no? But well, my, my dad used a lot of reverse psychology. My dad was an alcoholic. My dad's the hardest working, hard working man I've ever known in my life. My dad worked two jobs for 25 years. Uh, he'd go to work at 7 o'clock in the morning to 4, change jobs there, and go be a janitor at night from 5 to 1 o'clock. So my dad was from 7 to 1 every day. We saw my dad for 30 minutes before he we went to school every morning. He wakes up before he go to work uh, and leaves out $2 for lunch. Uh, and we see him on the weekends, and the weekends he was a drunk. He worked his butt off all week to make sure we had everything. The weekends, he was alcoholic. But one thing about my dad, and her question about what I learned from, my dad was the hardest working man. He said, my kids will have better than what I had. And I don't care what I got to do, in spite of his drinking and everything else, he taught us discipline and respect. And that you work hard for everything you get, that you don't expect anybody to give you anything, you earn it. And that's where I learned it. In spite of his differences and his issues, he still taught. I'm one of five boys, five of us. And that's what the other book's about. All five of us, usually when you got five boys in an African-American family, one of them's a knucklehead. One of them's in prison, as we, as we say all the time, got the orange jumpsuit on. Uh, one of them's a crackhead or drug head or think he cool, a pimp, whatever. All five of my brothers, my oldest brother is a senior vice president of, Pep, of 7 Up. My next brother is senior vice president of State Farm. Been there 25, 30 years. And then me. Then my next brother is Barack Obama's number two guy in Washington. He's number two in HUD and the president of all blacks in government worldwide. And then my baby brother is senior vice president of HR in, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So five boys, no knuckleheads, never been arrested. And my mom and dad didn't play all that stuff. Well, my mom, listen, we was, my dad was, we scared my dad, but my mom could throw some serious punches. If my mom said, don't do it, you may say a left hand coming next or a spatter or a shoe or whatever. 
My mama jacked you up. And so it was all about discipline and focus. And we knew that if we clowned in school, that we were going to get it when we get home. Because my dad would say, tell the teachers to call home. Or back then, it's when the neighbors could get you straight. So discipline. Self-discipline. And you had that support system around you. So it sounds like your dad, in many ways, was a role model. Who else were some of your role models? Well, obviously Martin Luther King uh, in, in the whole nonviolence piece. Uh, we love to read. Maya Angelou uh, was a great uh, individual. A lot of the black history stuff uh, was important to us. And then I would say the coaches I had in, in, in Little League, I had coaches that taught discipline uh, all through sports. I mean, I started playing sports when I was six years old. And people say, you know, sports will help you understand discipline and help teach you to be a better man. I'm a better man today because of sports and because of my coach at Michigan, Bo Schimbeckler. What is something, if you were back in high school now and you had the opportunity to have people like you come speak, what is something that you wish someone had told you when you were younger? That I, I think there are a lot of messages that we didn't get. What, what's a message that you wish you had gotten? Well, I did get that message. I got that message in the eighth grade uh, by Archie Griffin. Archie Griffin is the only player in history to win the Heisman Trophy twice from Ohio State University. Uh, and I happened to be speaking on the same tour with Archie here three months ago in Indiana. Archie said three things to me when I was eight years old, and I remember today, and I tell Archie thank you every time I sing. Desire dedication and termination the three d's he called it the 3d effect and i i was in the eighth grade sitting in the in, in the auditorium when him and cornelius cornelius green the quarterback of the house they came in and said desire determination and dedication you got to have that desire you got that burning desire folks to achieve you got to be determined to go after the things that you want to go after and pursue it and you got to be dedicated to it those three things resonate. Those three things I use today that helps me stay focused. When I get off, of, off on a tangent, I think about desire, determination, dedication. Jeff, last year you told the class a story about people that were on, people that you worked with that you knew from childhood. And your message to them was about who are the people you let on your team. And it was a pretty poignant story. I don't know if you want to tell the story or not, but what's your message? Is that the ones about where I got burned? Mm -hmm. uh, three years ago, that's, that's why I said sometimes you gotta cut people loose. Uh, I was gone from Columbus, Ohio for 25 years as a corporate executive. Came back to start, the one, my dad had a massive heart attack, so I came back to take care of my parents. And there was two friends I went to high school with that were struggling, so I brought them into my company. And uh, one night, I get, I'll short circuit the story a little bit. One night, I got a call from one of the young man's wife. And she said, boy, we're getting a lot of things in this house that, we, you know, I know what you're paying my husband. Where's it coming from? Long story short, uh, be careful who you bring into your fold, regardless of how close you think they are to. Well, those are the ones that hurt you the most, most of the time. These two gentlemen embezzled $635,000 from me. Almost shut me down almost shut my business down, and almost took me out of here. $635,000. Two very close friends of mine who I gave an opportunity to that needed a chance that sold me down the river and stole $635,000. I ain't say 635 cents. $1,000. Because I trusted them. Now, I'm not telling you don't trust people, because I, I do the opposite of the most. I trust you until you give me reason not to trust you. But never, ever believe that somebody can handle your business or your situation better than you can. Don't ever get complacent to think that everybody has your best interests, because they don't. And that's why I said, always be careful because I told my kids growing up all the time, you are who you're around. If you're hanging around hoodlums, you're going to be a hoodlum. If you're hanging around thugs, you're going to be a thug. 
my baby girl, this is pretty she want to be. Pretty, model, beautiful girl. But she keeps them boys in check. She gives you money, little fellas. I never forget, two years ago, a young fella came up to her and was trying to push up on her at a game, and I had to be standing there. And he knew I was her daddy. And he said something to her, all disrespectful. She said, I walked up, she said, Daddy, I got this. I got this. I said, baby, no, he didn't disrespect you like that. She said, Daddy, I got this. She said, you and Mama taught me how to handle this. She said, Daddy, I got it. Leave it alone, I got it. She went up in the little boy's face, she said, let me tell you something. The next time you disrespect me, I'm going to knock you out. That little boy said, you ain't going to knock me out. And she said, no, I'm telling you, you don't talk to me like that. My mama don't talk to me that way, my dad don't talk to me that way, and you're not going to talk to me that way. And next time you think you are, you got a problem with me. So he got on my look, then I stepped up, and I said, you got a problem? That's my baby girl. And she told you, get out of her face. And next time you get in her face, I'm going to let her knock you out. <laughs> See, she knows who she is. She knows who she is. Because, see, her daddy didn't treat her that way, and her mama didn't treat her that way, and she didn't let some young boy treat her that way. I don't care how cool he think he is or how good looking he is. From Wesley Smythe to Denzel Washington, you're going to treat her with respect. And you young ladies better make these boys treat you with respect. Questions? You, my last question, then you guys. You talked about not 10 years ago you might not do this and uh, it's apparent you're an excellent speaker and you also said that one of your dreams was to be on the speaking circuit what what did you have to do what what did you do that made this happen uh, the biggest thing was do a lot of networking I mean you, you, you got a lot you know a lot of no's a lot of no's a lot of no's a lot of no's uh, and I still get no's but the thing that I had to do was one for 10 years, I talked about writing a book, and people encouraged me to write a book. And uh, you know, I, I get about eight or nine books in me. I just don't have the time to write them. Uh, but I had to keep beating the bushes. I had to keep talking to people, meeting people that I always wanted to meet, people that had written books, people that had gone through the process of writing books, uh, of, of going through the process of talking to people that was on the speaking circuit, going and watch people speak. You emulate those what you see. So if you want to be a speaker, you go learn what they do good. Or wherever you want to be, you do your homework. So I started doing research of people that I admire. What they were talking, Ken Blanchard is one of them. Les Brown is another. I start looking, watching people, watching their videos, reading their books, watching them on, on YouTube. I start researching those that I respected and what their message was, pastors. You know, there, there's a good friend, pastor here in Atlanta, he's a good friend of mine. I'm not saying his name because he's in trouble right now, but he's a good friend of mine. And I'm not ashamed of Bishop Long. Right, wrong, or indifferent, I don't know. Okay, but I'm not here to judge. Now, I have an opinion, but I'm not saying. But bottom line is, you know, we all, we all get in situations that, you know, do things that's, that probably inappropriate, not appropriate, or whatever, and I'm not here to judge, God will make that decision at some point in time, not me. 